Good afternoon, Professor. Good, Good afternoon. afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And sorry, I'm a little. I'm uh I'm late. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. And okay. Good. Uh, good afternoon. Well, that was Caroline, Amanda, Caitlin, Kevin, Christina, Elda, Amy, Amy. I think I'm not even sure who that. Okay. And good afternoon, Kevin. Aman good afternoon, Amanda. Good afternoon, Alicia. Good afternoon, David K. Good afternoon, Jamalette. Good afternoon, Chloe. Good afternoon, Caitlin. Good afternoon, Felicia. Good afternoon, Sophia. Hi, Christina. Good Elda. Good afternoon, Amy C. Okay. Straight to it. Um, oh, except that my board just disappeared again. Okay. We're going to get straight to it. I think every it's that time of the year. I think everybody's getting well, I'm getting tired. Um, OK, we're, here's what we're going to go straight to another Newton's law problem. That is we're going to okay, gonna go one step further from the problem that we did last. That doesn't even speak. That says the inclined plane. That doesn't, that's not even readable. Hold on. Um, okay, just very quickly, the problem that was put on the board last Wednesday, and that I think we we went over. I think I walked through it. I think I got to the end. Tell me if I didn't. If you submit that for this Wednesday midnight. So today, there's no there's no other new homework or anything like that. Everybody's just catching up. You guys are catching up. I'm catching up. It, the whole the problem that I put on the board last class, and I think I went over. And there's two videos about it now that you can definitely watch. I mean, I mean, you know, there's your class section and the other class section. I may have gotten to slightly different places in the two, but anyway, that problem that I put on. The board Wednesday, if you submit it by midnight this Wednesday, you get a bunch of extra exam points from it. Um, I'm happy to answer any physics questions about it um, today in class or uh, tomorrow during office hours or Wednesday during class, but I'm going to go, so please do. But right now, and, and some of you still have to get your exams back. I think most of you have gotten them back already. A couple of you, I'm finding some of them as I'm just plodding along very slowly, inefficiently. Um, but I think most of them have come back. There's still some that haven't. That I am finding sometimes, even though it's at this late stage, and I say this with some embarrassment, with some of the documents, I can see that they're there. I can see that they were there on time. I can see that, but I cannot access them for some reason. They won't load for grading purposes. Often that it, it 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 shouldn't matter what kind of document it is, but I know PDF is safest. So if I wrote you a note, or or if you see there's any issue at all with your exam, or if it's like a even if it's a Google Doc, which should work, but some of them are not working lately. Um, if there's any doubt in your mind, if you can re-upload, or especially if I wrote you a note to that effect, if you can re-upload, don't remove the old, just upload a new, and it won't. It's not late or anything like that, but that would help the the few that are still I'm having trouble with. But anyway, um, but again, for everybody, whether you saw your score or not, you can get a lot more points if you do the problem um, that we walked through last Wednesday. You can also come ask me questions, blah, blah, blah. Again, to all of you, to, you know, we're all in this to do well, not to do badly. Um, and I know how hard many of you are working. Um, I'm going to go on with the material now. What, what the problem I want to do now, um, which often appears on the final exam, actually, and we'll we'll get to talking about that probably this Wednesday also. But the problem I'm going to do now is also a Newton's law problem so based on the last one. It's like again one step harder than the last one. I mean, it's a force problem. It's one step harder than the last one. But what I'm going to do now is re remarkably similar if remarkably similar to what you did in lab a few weeks ago. And I know you submitted the report and all that. Um, hopefully 
uh, even if um, hopefully what I'm going to do now will clarify some of the things that you were struggling with or thinking about in the lab. Hopefully the fact that you did the lab will make this problem a lot more clear uh, and understandable. Um, um, and as I say, it's one step further from the last one we did. So what's the deal? So this is the deal. The problem now is we have a block of mass M on a ramp or you know on a lab table or something that's rough, just like last Wednesday. Um, so it's rough. It has a coefficient of friction called mu. We could even, um, you could sometimes call that mu sub K. Sometimes we do. Um, I'll explain more why that is. I mean, technically, there are two different kinds of coefficients of friction. I'm, I'm only concerned with one right now. <sighs> sorry. Anyway, this block is on an inclined plane. The inclined, pl sorry. This block is on a surface. The surface is rough because it's rough because it has friction, uh, uh, an amount of roughness. We call that roughness mu. I'm not even presenting numbers for this problem now. As I say, it's one step, maybe it's two steps harder than the last one. I'm just giving the names of the pieces of information. I'm saying that the, the, the coefficient of friction is mu. I'm saying the mass of the block is m. And then now I'm saying that much like in the lab, this surface that the block is on, instead of being purely horizontal, the surface itself is angled. It's a plane that we say is inclined at a certain angle, angle measured from the horizontal, that angle we call theta. And the ultimate, the ultimate question sort of as always is, at what rate would this block accelerate along the plane if the plane were rough and if the plane were inclined according to these given pieces of information here? Um, so, So we are going to get, as you sort of did in the lab, when I say we're going to find A, what I mean is we're going to determine A, the acceleration, as a function of these given constants and, and universal values, these given values, um, mass, acceleration due to gravity, lowercase g, um, theta, the angle, and mu, the coefficient of friction. So we're going to get an answer that doesn't have numbers in it, that just is a long expression um, containing no more than those given values. No more than. It might not contain all of those values. It might turn out that some of those values are not necessary or that they, and they're not, it might turn out that it will turn out that some of those values will cancel out in our calculations that they'll turn out to be unnecessary for our final answer. It doesn't mean that they're there as a trick. It doesn't mean that they're there intentionally to confuse you. It means that these are the kind of pieces of information that we can measure in a lab and have as we start off in our analysis or investigation. And, and if any of them turns out to cancel out and not be necessary or not determine our final answer, then that's an interesting discovery. Um, and that's why I'm giving all these pieces of information to begin with. These are all the things that you could measure in a lab. Um, and if it turned out that you didn't need any of these measurements, that's actually, as I say, an interesting discovery. All right, so, but when I say that something is, when I say that A is a function of those values, I mean, we could use any, um, uh, any of those values up to and including that full list, but but that we shouldn't need anything more than that list. Okay, I'm, I'm already talking to you. Okay, so, so we're gonna do...
Okay. All right. So I'm just right here. I just repeated what the givens are for the problem. We have a mass M. We have roughness of surface coefficient mu. We have angle of inclination for that surface theta. And we're assuming that we're in a lab at the surface of Earth. So the downward um, free fall acceleration constant due to gravity is lowercase g. And we're assuming that lowercase g points down, points down, um, um, points down. And whether that means negative or positive, we will ultimately assign in our coordinate system and use when we uh, analyze all of our forces. But but the actual value of that acceleration is just is just a, a number like nine point eight or ten or thirty two if we're in feet. Um, um, it, so it's just a number that we assign with a letter called lowercase g, and it doesn't have a negative or a positive um, assigned to it. It, it. That somebody actually got concerned about that in the other class. I'm just saying. So g is just the number. Whether we can assign negatives or positives will come up once we're analyzing all the forces. Okay, so our goal, okay, sorry, uh, our goal is to calculate acceleration while this thing is sliding. Sorry, someone's here while this thing is sliding. Um, and um, and I'm going to I'm going to embark on our normal procedure, system scheme, a free body diagram, component free body diagram, da 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 da. Um, well, one thing I have to say from the start, though, since this thing has friction, and this is one thing that you um, uh, found out in lab lab five, since this thing is friction, No problem. Thank you. No problem. No word. Thank you, though. Um, so do I, actually. Okay, first thing I'm going to say before going any further, again, I'm going to do the normal procedure. I don't, um, and yes, you already thought about this to someone in the lab, but I'm going to start by saying, look, friction, friction, there's going to be friction here. The surface is rough. Friction opposes the direction of expected motion. So friction. So if the block is 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 sliding down, friction's going to point up. If the block happens to be sliding up, friction's going to point down. So friction can do one of two different things. Therefore, I'm going to distinguish between the two directions. I'm going to I'm going to um, analyze. I'm going to get an answer when I ask what's the acceleration of this block sliding on a plane. That's actually two different questions. What's the acceleration of the block when it's when it's sliding down the plane? versus what's the acceleration of the block when it's sliding up the plane? Like, I'm actually not sure those are going to be the same answers. In fact, since you did lab five, I think you found they're not the same answers. And they don't just differ by a sign. I mean, they're different numbers, which is interesting in itself. So um, so I'm going to do this in two different cases, acceleration up and accel or down and acceleration versus uh, up. Um, that's number one. There was one other thing I was going to say. All right. So it's really two different questions. That said, I'm going to embark on our normal procedure. Um, the normal procedure for doing a Newton's law problem, for doing a problem involving forces and accelerations, the norm, the customary procedure is we do system schema, then we do pure free body diagram, then we do component free body diagram, then we solve F net equals MA along each axis. So here we go. 
but that you do want to know that procedure. And by, I, I don't mean, I, we still have our five step method for solving problems in general. You know, step one, diagram and fact pattern. Step two, what is the question, et cetera. That still is true. I think that is the right method to do in general for any physics problem for all time. But I'm now saying specifically when we do a Newton's law problem, there's a specific version of that procedure. There's specific steps that we do that. So I'm following this specific set of procedures um, for solving. So Okay, so first I draw a system and okay, so first I draw a system schema. I have my mass, which gets a dotted circle right around it. Then I always draw planet Earth because planet Earth is always there. I draw it somewhere like I usually draw it like up somewhere just to make it really clear that I don't care about direction in this diagram. So I draw planet Earth. Then I draw anything and everything that's touching my mass, right? Anything and everything that's touching my mass. So we'll call that the, the, the table or the plane, as in the surface, you know, the, the, the slide, the plane, the table, whatever you want to call it. And there's nothing else touching my mass. So planet Earth is not touching my mass, but it is always there, always pulling gravitationally. So it gets a line, right? It's one of the exceptions to the one touch one line rule. It's not touching, but it is planet earth. So it gets a line. Then the plane, the table, the lab table, whatever you want to call it, is a surface that is touching my mass, but it's a surface that's pushing against the surface of my mass, right? It's underneath the mass, two surfaces pushing together. So that's a case where there is touch. So there is a line, but since it's two surfaces pushing, we always say that there's always two lines Right. And that why? Because the two surfaces are pushing against each other like this, but they're rough. So they're necessarily, therefore, also touching each other or pushing each other like that. Whenever two surfaces push against each other, they push against. We call that normal. And they also push along. We call that friction. So so it gets two lines. There's nothing else. Uh, touching my mass. Uh, so this is the system schema. To be clear, one thing about the system schema is this is true for both cases. Whether the mass is sliding down or sliding up, this diagram is true. Um, you might say, how could this, the mass possibly be sliding up? If if we, like you did in lab, even if, if you flicked the lab, if you flicked the mass initially, if you gave it a little tap with your finger, if you gave it an initial velocity, that would send the mass sliding up the plane. Once you let go of the mat, once your finger is no longer touching it, the mass at any and every given moment is sliding up the plane until it reaches the top and starts coming back down. This diagram would apply to any and every moment along, along the mass's trajectory up or and or the mass's trajectory down. In other words, what I'm trying to say is that that moment when you touched the mass is before the whole experiment began. The experiment begins once the mass has been released and is moving on its own. Your initial touch is not a force. It's not a contact at any given moment while this problem is occurring. It's 
it is just an initial velocity, a V naught. It's not an acceleration. It's not a force. It's not part of the experiment. So whether the mass is going up or going down, these are the only things touching it, or these are the only things affecting it, planet Earth and the inclined plane itself. Okay, so that's the diagram, the system schema. Now we go to a pure free body diagram. All right, first, if the mass is sliding down. So this is at, at some moment, at some point in time where the mass happens to be sliding down. Okay, so I look at my free body. So I look at my, and remember again, like now direction matters. The reason I didn't draw two different system schemas, system schema never cares about direction. System schema is just there to tell me what forces are actually acting. Now in the pure free body diagram, I have to actually note what directions they're acting in. So direction now matters. That's the whole point of the free body diagram. So now whether we're going up or down is going to matter. Now, first of all, there's that planet Earth in the system schema. It's always there. It always is pulling on our mass gravitationally down with a force of mg no matter what. So that line in the system schema that points to planet Earth becomes an arrow in the pre in the free body diagram that points down called mg always 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 okay now there's two more lines in our system schema that's going to make for two more arrows in our free body diagram in our pure free body diagram well one of those arrows oh pardon me H hold on one second uh sorry um pardon me pardon me sorry yeah, I coming. Uh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. I thought I thought you were all setting that up for me to go get him. So here. Sorry. Here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 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 Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Um. Okay, so one of those. One of those two lines. In the system schema is the line that represents the plane pushing. A, a, against. The block of mass M. Pushing perpendicular to the plane of contact. That's what we call the normal force, right? So one of those two lines in the system schema is the normal force. And the direction of the normal force, I look at my original picture. Oh my God, my board just died again. Why? Excuse me for a second. Okay, if I look at, it's gonna, yeah, if I look at the picture, the picture is important. Now this picture is not a diagram, right? This is like part of step one, DFP. Maybe I should be making this clear. That picture is like the picture of the facts, the diagram of the facts. And it's important not only because it's labeling the variables and constants that I'm gonna use in my equations, but also it's showing me the way to orient my perspective. Like in that picture, the inclined plane happens to be going from bottom left to top right. 
right? That's just, that's arbitrary. Obviously a plane could be going at any angle in the lab, but that picture says that the plane is, is going, sorry, I keep, is going, wait, why can I not? It's weird. Oh yeah, okay. The, that's the mirror thing, right, right, right. All right, that plane is going like that, according to the picture. So, so therefore, the normal force arrow has to be going perpendicular to that surface depicted in that picture, okay? So the normal, this is kind of important for the final exam. So the normal for, like this picture doesn't mean anything about directions. That's just showing me objects and showing me what, how many forces must be in my free body diagram. There's three lines there. So there's gonna be three arrows in my free body diagram. But the arrow that represents the normal force now must, according to, according to uh, my original sketch, must be going off into the left. I hope that's clear. Like if my, like if you were taking an exam, right, and and I just said in words like, oh, uh, let's let's analyze a rough inclined plane. You could draw your plane any way you want. I mean, the plane could be going the other way, right? But then once you draw your plane, and this is part of why you have to draw a diagram in step one. Once you draw your plane, then everything's going to be like based on that. So that diagram was DFP. Now, arguably everything I'm doing here for, and then we said, what's the question? The question is we'll solve for A. So step two, WIQ is A equals question mark. Now, everything I'm doing here, all the step A, step B, step C, all these diagrams, arguably this is all part of GDP. This is all general definitions and principles and or step four, uh, you know, um, a particular application and work. But what, so I hope that's like, a, but notice that's why I'm calling these steps like A, B, and C rather than one, two, and three. I hope I'm making some sense, but I'm sure I'm not. But anyway, I've got now two arrows in my free body diagram. That's two of the three lines in the system schema that have been now covered. These two are true, no matter what, whether the block is going up or down. They're just both, ba they're both based on the orientation of planet Earth and the orientation of this plane. But now, okay, now I say, we are picturing a situation where the block is sliding down the plane. So that other line in my system schema, which represents the force of friction, that, that arrow must be pointing up and to the right. Like this is friction now. If the block is indeed sliding down, you see what I'm saying? And notice these are all different pictures, all accomplishing different things. In this picture, all I'm putting in is forces. I'm not putting in velocities. I'm not putting in accelerations. I'm not putting in other objects. These are the forces acting on the mass in the directions that they're actually asking. So we're acting. So we've got the normal force going up and to the left. We've got friction necessarily perpendicular to that normal force, friction going up and to the right. And we've got uh, weight, the force of gravity pulling straight down. That is my pure free body diagram by pure free body diagram uh, for some moment when the mass is traveling down the plane. And down means to the left, according to my original picture. Okay, I think you get that. Also, hopefully this is familiar. You've seen this before from the lab. Now, before I do anything with it, just to make it clear, I'm going to go to what about when we're going up the plane, which again is totally possible. All I have to do is give a block a little nudge at the beginning and then it'll go up the plane. It won't go up forever. It'll go for a while and then start coming back down, but it totally can go up. So, so we're gonna do now sliding up the plane. Who's with me? Okay. All right, so this is sliding up. Again, the pure free body diagram. Well, gravity is still pointing straight down as it always does. The normal force is still doing exactly what it was. Like no one has rotated the plane or anything like that. But now the object is going up rather than down. So friction goes against it. Friction is going down rather than up. Okay, so friction can flip. Or friction does flip its direction. Friction is always opposing Okay. 
Now, what is the purpose of all this? I, I mean, the, the purpose is to take these forces, plug them into the left side of F net equals MA and solve for acceleration. Um, but remember, F net equals MA is a vector equation. Well, So the purpose of the diagram is to get the Fs that are going to be plugged into the left side of F net equals MA to add them, to know what to add all up and get A, right? But the whole thing is that F net equals MA is a vector equation. It applies independently yet simultaneously to each axis one at a time. In other words, Thank you. I love, thank you. I, that actually helps a lot, particularly today. Thank you, Nicholas. I appreciate that. Okay. Is a vector equation. Okay, it's, it's really important. And again, this is one of these things that I, I honestly, I did not understand this until I did. Like I was doing this stuff for years until it really sank in with me. Like, oh, F net equals MA, the vector equation. What it really means is the sum of all the F, excuse me, it means the sum of all the X forces equals M times A in the X direction. And the sum of all the Y forces yields M times A in the Y direction. And if there are any Z forces, then all of them added up together equals M times A in the Z direction. Like, and that's always true. It just happens in this case, we have a two dimensional problem. We've got things in this axis and this axis. We don't have anything in the Z axis, so I don't care, but it's still true. But so the whole real thing is that F net equals MA applies to one axis at a time. But if you look at our picture, and this is where now your work in the lab really comes into play. If you look at our picture, we don't have, it doesn't appear that we just have things happening in one axis at a time. Like we have things going on in this axis, MG, but then we don't have just things going in this axis. We've got things going up on diagonal lines. That's like our real issue. This is actually where all the hard work comes in. This is where people may definitely have gotten confused in lab five, whether they did it correct, whether you did it correctly or not, whether you did it confidently or not, whether you did it or not, you really, in this step of breaking up the arrows into components is honestly where, you, where most of us get challenged or have been challenged. So what I'm going to do now, and this is important, and again, I'm saying all this knowing you've already been in the lab, knowing you've already done some work and handed a thing in, like I know all that, but I, I'm doing two things. One, I'm trying to now show you why you did all that, why you did that lab. I'm, it's not so much that I'm trying to now help you do a lab you've already done. It's that I'm hoping that you are having done that lab will help you understand what I'm going to try to say now. Um, also, because I'm going to expand this and go places with it, is that in order to use F net equals MA, we now have to always do the next step. We have to take our pure free body diagrams and break them up into component free body diagrams. We have to break up our forces into constituent components that lie along X and Y axes. 
like you did in the in the exam, like with the boat and stream velocities. Like you've done this before with velocities. You did it originally with displacement in lab three. The, any quantity in physics that's a vector can and should be broken up into components lying along constituent component axes. That's why we keep revisiting that skill. So that's what we're going to do here. The thing is, this is where Galileo comes into play. The part that we have to be really conscious of, the part that's really physics, not just raw computational math. Um, Okay, in order to break our force vectors into X and Y components, we have to know what our X and Y axes are. This is the Galileo thing. We have to choose a core. Physics will be true in any coordinate system, but it's true only within a coordinate system. So we've got to know what coordinate system we're in and stay in that coordinate system in order to run the laws of physics, okay? What I'm going to do now, now this is very subtle. I've got 35 minutes. I'm going to do something subtle now, I, possibly challenging. What I'm going to do now to show you how this works is I'm going to choose a coordinate system, but I'm not going to choose the one that you chose in lab. Let me say that again. This is where all this stuff should hopefully look familiar from lab, but I'm about to go in a different direction. It's all meant to come together. It's all meant to teach you something, I promise. But I'm about to go in a slightly different direction and then I'll come back to the lab. But I'm about to go in a different direction to show you what you did in the lab, possibly the most confusing step, the step in the lab that you did that confuses people the most. I'm about to do something different now to ultimately show you why I did that, to be a little bit more concrete. In lab, you took that MG vector the straight down vector of MG, and you broke it up into two diagonal lines, one that was MG sine theta and one that's MG cosine theta. Those of you who actually did the lab or did the work know what I'm talking about. You broke MG into sine and cosine. Some of you might've thought hard about it and gotten, and gotten confused or concerned. Some of you might've just accepted it and moved on, or, and some of you did something in between. I'm here to say it is confusing to break mg into mg sine theta and mg cosine theta. There's a reason we do it for sure. I, it's not wrong at all, um, but it certainly is confusing. The first many times that people see, it's confusing why we do it. And it's confusing, how do you know which one is sine and which one is cosine? If you even had a moment of bump on that weeks ago when you were in the lab, if even for a moment, you're like, wait, what? I'm breaking up to mg, huh? Wait, that one's mg sine theta, okay. Even if you then were like, okay, whatever, it's school, I'll just accept it. Please go back to that moment where for one second you were like, huh? I broke up MG, why are we doing that? And like, how do I know which is which? If you even thought that for one minute, first of all, praise yourself, you're not crazy for being confused about that. It's not wrong, but it is confusing. If you even thought for one minute, why am I breaking up MG? Good, that's a good physics question to be concerned with. What I'm going to do now, I'm going to show you why. My ultimate goal is to show you why. Again, often this is all on the final exam, so that it's not just like abstract like meanderings. I'm going to show you why what we did with the MG, but the way I'm going to show you is first I'm going to do something different. 
I'm going to do this problem without breaking up Gen MG, okay? So you can see what happens when you don't. I, I'm not going to do something wrong. I'm going to do something right now, but something different from what you did in lab. So please bear with me or try, okay? And, or stop me if you have any confusion. But I'm about to do something that's not going to look like what you did in the lab. And it, it is, oh, okay, what I'm doing is this. I'm saying, and this is all about Galileo again. Galileo says the laws of physics are the same in all different unaccelerated reference frames, coordinate systems. So Galileo says it doesn't matter which one you choose, they're all correct as long as you actually consciously choose one. So the, the thing about Galileo is it means we do have to choose. No matter what choice we make, the laws will be correct, but some choices are more convenient for problem solving than others. In fact, sometimes, the choice that is ultimately the most convenient doesn't at first seem like it would be. This is part of the art of physics, is making these choices and knowing how to set up problems before you even do the computations. What I'm going to show you now is this. Let's say, let's say we choose... Okay, let's say, now uh, let's say we do the sort of obvious natural thing of saying, here's my coordinate system. This is the X axis, like lined up with the floor of my lab or lined up with the horizontal, the horizon. And let's say this is my Y axis, literally up and down, lined up with gravity, like, like a line that goes straight up to the ceiling, okay? Let's say we, we look at the world through this, untilted standard coordinate system. This would be a natural thing to do, right? Like there's no reason not to do it. And by the way, it's not wrong. It's totally right. It's what, if I walked into lab five, I would just assume that I would do something like this. Okay, I'm gonna tell you again, it's not what you actually did in the lab. And that's why some of you are confused because you would expect that we would do this, right? If I do this now, okay? So again, this is a new thing. Yeah. Also, if you think you rocked the lab, don't think this is redundant because it's not because it's not what you anyway. So let's say that we choose our coordinate system this way. It's not wrong. Galileo says we can make any choice we want as long as we make a choice. So let's say this is our coordinate system. Then what would we do? Then we would break up our forces into components that lie along this. OK, so this is what we this is the component diagrams this would produce.
Okay. Like, so I, remember my, our original pure, pure free body diagram for down, there was MG pointing straight down. Okay, MG is pointing straight down. So it's pointing straight down. So it's along an axis that's, that's already my Y axis. So I don't have to do anything to MG, but see friction and normal. If I choose this coordinate system, Friction and normal are off axis now. They're diagonal lines. They have to be broken up into components that lie along the X and Y axis. So first let me look at friction. So right friction, like turn back to your picture of down, friction's pointing up and to the right, I believe. Yeah, pointing up and to the right. So that angle there from that friction makes with the horizontal is theta. The angle that friction makes with the horizontal is theta. How do I know? Because the whole inclined plane was angled from the horizontal at theta, right? From the horizontal. So friction is perfectly parallel to the plane, right? So now from Sokotoa, the sine is opposite over hypotenuse and cosine is adjacent over the hypotenuse, then I know that this component is F cosine theta and this component is F sine theta, like, right? I, maybe I should have drawn. So if I zoom in on friction, friction's really doing two jobs. Friction's pushing up and to the right. That means it's pushing somewhat to the right and it's pushing somewhat up. How much of each? Cosine and sine, right? That's the, the two components of friction. What I'm going to do is substitute those into my diagram in a minute when I make a component diagram because I need components that only point along axes, right? So I zoomed in on friction and I got those two components. I'm going to do the same thing to the normal force, right? But with the normal force, the normal force is going up, uh, um, uh, is, is going, is perpendicular to friction. So, so the angle the normal force is making with the, with the horizontal is not the same as theta. The angle the like like when I, 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 no don't, oh no no I went again. I just lost my board. Or I think I think the board is disappearing on a delay. Hold on, just, maybe not. Can you still see the board? I don't know what's about to happen. To I'm still drawing on the board. I don't know if you, you can't see it. I know. I'm, hold on one sec. I mean, you can see it, but you can't see what I'm drawing. Hold on. Okay, hold on. It's coming back, I promise. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, so there it is. So now there's a little subtle. Please bear with me. I mean, this is this is not easy, but I think it, but it's true. And I think it's clear if you think it through. Friction, I did first. I put something that's making this, I probably should have put friction over to the left. It doesn't matter where I'm putting it, but friction I did first because friction is angled exactly the way the plane is angled. Like, let me remind you, and you might want to put this in your notes. The whole point is theta was a constant that was given to us. We know theta is the original angle of the original plane. Now friction is angled just as the plane is. So the two components of friction follow it directly. The normal force is perpendicular to theta. So what, excuse me, is, is perpendicular to friction. So what I'm really saying is that angle being made with the horizontal by the normal force, it's not the same angle as theta. It's the complement of theta. If you really think it through, there's different ways of thinking this through. But really, the angle up there in the triangle is, is the same as the original theta. You could say when two parallel lines are cut by a transversal, the alternate interior angles are congruent. or However you want to see it, I'm saying friction and normal are perpendicular. So their components should be 
the, the reverse of each other. What, what is opposite for one should be the adjacent for the other, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm ultimately saying if I zoom in on the normal force, it's, its components are cosine up and sine over. You might even say, and I don't want to, you might even say, wait, I thought sine's always supposed to be whole, uh, vertical and um, cosine's always supposed to be horizontal. Well, the truth is, no, that's not actually the case. Co I know people get used to that from the unit circle, but the, what is true is that cosine is always adjacent and sine is always opposite. And it's opposite depending on what angle you're talking about. You could say to me, wait, well, then couldn't we just draw the angle down at the bottom and keep our life simple? You could draw a angle down at the bottom, but that wouldn't be the same as the original theta that we were given in this problem. It would be the complement to it. I know I'm going a little fast. You just want, might want to think that through, but I'm saying the angle at the bottom of the triangle of the normal vector is the, not the same as the, tri, as the angle at the bottom of the friction triangle. They're complements of each other. Why are they complements? Because friction and the normal are perpendicular to each other. What am I saying with all of this? What is my point? My point is, according to this coordinate system, the one that would seem easy and natural, when you just walk in the room and you're like, here's my, I'm just looking at the world through graph paper that's just like this. And I'm just looking at the floor as an x-axis. And I'm looking at the, you, you, like at the walls as a y-axis. If you take that seemingly natural coordinate system, there's nothing wrong with it. It's right, but it means that the normal force and the friction force are both off axis. So they both have to be zoomed in on and divided up into components. Okay, still not wrong, just complicated. And therefore the component free body diagram that you would make, for the object sliding down the inclined plane, okay, in this, in this coordinate system, the component, the component FBD for mass sliding down, is is there for this is mg sliding mg still pulling down right because it's along the y-axis but then we've got friction pointing somewhat to the right at cosine theta and somewhat up Right? If the object is sliding down, then friction is pushing up and to the right. And the normal is pushing somewhat up and somewhat over. Right, And notice what I'm doing. The whole purpose of zooming in was to break any vector into its two components and then substitute those components back into the component diagram, not add them like additionally, but replace them. So there's no more normal in my diagram. There's normal cos and normal sine. And there's no more friction. There's friction cosine and friction sine, right? It's a substitution. So, so since two vectors got broken up into two components each, I now have five vectors in this diagram instead of three. Okay, this would be the picture for down. And what's the point of all this? Then I say for down, therefore, For a down, I can finally now do f net equals ma, and I would say, okay, f net equals ma along each axis, f, right? So let's look at the y-axis first. <coughs> Sorry, I would say n, so I'm now just looking at the y-axis. I've got n cosine pointing up. Oh, and we said that up is positive and down is negative, I said in my original picture. So we got n cosine up plus f sine up minus mg down, all equals ma in the y direction. In other words, ma sine theta. <coughs> Excuse me. And in the x direction, 
So this is the, that's the y axis. In the x axis, I've got I look at the x axis now. So I've got n sine. Excuse me. make one correction here. I'm looking back at my original coordinates where I decided positive and negative. I'm deciding that up is positive, right? And down is negative. But the block is sliding down the plane. Like it slides, it accelerates down to the left. So I actually think, it, this is a minor point, but I think actually left should be negative and right should be positive. This is, uh, again, a total choice. You could do whatever you want. I think that'll make it a little bit easier. If you don't like that, you can change it. But um, but I'm because the block is actually sliding that way. So I would say with that, n sine theta points to the left, that's positive, and f and friction points to the right, that's negative. So all that equals m a cos. Oh, sorry, just make it fit better. So I've got two equations, two unknowns. What am I solving for? I'm solving for A. But, but the reason I need two equations here is I'm solving for A, but I also don't know N. So I've got two unknowns, two equations. Like, like I'm solving for this. Like that's unknown, unknown. But this is unknown too. This is unknown. Oh. And how do I do that? I remember that friction, this goes back to last Wednesday, friction is mu times the normal. So I'm going to substitute that in. So we're almost there, but this is a lot, right? I mean, it is a lot. So I go, okay. I go, and cosine theta minus mu times n plus mu times n sine theta minus mg equals ma sine theta. That's from one equation. And from the other equation, I say um, n sine theta minus mu n cosine theta equals m a cosine theta. Now I have two equations and two unknowns. Unknown, unknown. So that's a lot. Okay, I'm saying, now this is solvable. This is not incorrect. I'm not trying to waste your time. This is all correct. And this is what we would do if we just kept the natural coordinate system. We would break all the forces into the components this way. 
we would write each equation. And now we've got two equations that have N in them and two equations that have A in them. We would rewrite each equation for N, set the two Ns equal to each other or substitute in and solve for A. I might in fact even show you that on Wednesday because it might in fact even be on your final exam. And I'm not trying to play with you. Like I'm, just, I'm not sure yet. Sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. And I'll let you know, but, but, but it's a lot, you could see this is a lot of work. Now it's not wrong. It's totally right. And in fact, it's even natural. It's might maybe what we would all do or we'd be forced to do if we if we were just sort of doing the math step by step. But but I'm going to pause on, I'm going to leave that for there and say, but You see, it is our choice to decide what coordinate system we're doing the physics in. No matter what, we have to be in a coordinate system. We have to divide these diagonal lines into components, into cosines and sines. But we can choose to do that any way that's convenient. So what we do to make our life a little bit easier, at first it seems harder, but what long-term makes it easier is we say, let's line, let's align our x-axis with the expected direction of acceleration, i.e. with the inclined plane. Let's, okay, what we did, you might have realized that you might not in the lab, what we did to solve this, or what you did, is we said, let's tilt our head. Let's say that this is the x-axis, and this is the y-axis, we aligned our x-axis with the direction in which the mass is actually going to accelerate with the plane itself. So we said in this case, if we till, if we, because we can do this, this is what Galileo says, the laws of physics don't change just because we're looking from another perspective. So if we look from this perspective and we look at the, and we zoom in on the forces to break up any force that is not aligned with an axis, we realize the normal force is lined up with the y-axis and the friction force is lined up with the x-axis and the acceleration is lined up with the x-axis. We don't have to break any of those threes into cosines and sines. All we would have to break up is gravity. Gravity is the one and only force we'd have to break up if we tilt our head. So therefore we tilt our head and we say, oh, gravity, you are actually a hypotenuse in this world. This is mg. It actually has some component that's pointing along our, our, our new x-axis, and it has some component that's lying along our y-axis. Remember, an x tip to tail plus y tip to tail equals the whole vector, right? And in this case, you see what I'm, okay? Um, and in this case, the whole angle just like before the normal, if you think through the geometry, and I only have seven minutes left, so I may expand on this on Wednesday, but if you think through the geometry, the angle that's originally given, the angle that the plane makes with the horizontal, with, that the plane makes with the horizontal, is, is just that. It's the angle that the plane makes with the horizontal. So that's not this up here, like, like,
right? If, if that dotted arrow the, along the x-axis is parallel to the plane, right? Then the angle between it and the vertical is not the angle that it makes with the horizontal. It's parallel to, I mean, it's complementary to that. So the other one must be the angle, just like, see, so the normal force that we broke up before was like a warm up to this idea. But the original angle that we were given theta, whatever, 30 degrees, whatever it was, must be the angle down here in this triangle. So the opposite of that is a cross, is the sine, and the adjacent to that is the cosine. So this must be mg sine, and this is mg cosine. That's where that came from, okay? And I'll, I'll expand on that again on Wednesday if at all helpful. But I'm saying I'm zooming in on mg. And again, this is confusing. When you first see in the lab, it's like, why are we zooming in on MG? Why are we breaking up MG? I thought MG is a straight vertical line. It is a straight vertical line. But what we're saying is if we keep vertical as one of our axes, we have to break up three other things. That's the problem. If you just look at this in the natural instinctive way and just say, this is my X axis and this is my Y, you end up having to break up three things, friction, normal, and acceleration. But if you tilt your head, and say, this is the x-axis, then nothing else has to be broken up except for gravity. So we break up gravity and we realize that for the earth to pull down on the block is really to do two jobs. To some extent, pull it along the plane and to some extent, keep it against the plane. So the first job is mg sine theta. The second job is mg cosine theta. So now we can, we're almost done. We have four and a half minutes. So now our component diagram So the, the component diagram in this coordinate system becomes, okay, N is still what it was. Friction is still what it was, but MG now gets broken up into MG sine, like you did in the lab, and MG cosine. That looks confusing when you first look at it. What I'm saying is it's a heck of a lot. Of, the reason we do it is not because it's the only right way. It's because it's ultimately, it's confusing at first, but it's a more convenient way than the other thing. The other thing we had like five arrows. Here we only have four. And the other way, A had to be broken up into sine and cosine and A won't have to be broken up. In other words, here we can say, so now we do F net equals MA along the Y axis. Along the Y axis, we say N minus MG cosine theta equals ma along the y-axis. But here, because we chose an x-axis that is fully aligned with the acceleration of the block, along the y-axis, in this case, there is no acceleration. The block is not flying off the plane or breaking into the plane, right? I couldn't say this in the other coordinate system. But here, here I can say that ay equals zero. So not, so not just a sine theta or not just a, but literally zero. So here I can literally say N equals mg cosine theta. That's much simpler than the other thing. And if I do, if I break up the forces in the X direction, now I'm going to say mg sine theta minus friction equals ma x and max is just ma there is all of the block is entirely accelerating along the x-axis how do i know because i chose the x-axis to line up with the acceleration that's part of the point of this oh, oh, i'm sorry so and what is f f is friction friction is mu times the normal But what is normal, the normal I just found out is nice and simple. It's just mg cosine theta. So I can say, and we're just about to, we have one minute and we'll, we're done. mg sine theta 
minus mu mg cos theta equals ma. Each term has an m. I could divide both sides by m, so they all cancel out. And this is my answer. When the block is sliding down the plane, a equals g sine theta minus g cosine theta. That's for down the plane. And if the block were sliding up the plane, the only difference is that friction would flip the other direction. So it would be a plus mu g cosine theta. That would be the, oh, that's the difference between down and up. It's going to be two different numbers when we plug in, but, but that's it. It's that simple. It's a lot. So it's a little confusing at first, but it's a lot less work than if we did the natural thing of lining up the x-axis with the horizon and the y-axis with gravity. I will expand again more on this or answer more questions on Wednesday, but this is what you did in the lab. This is how you get the acceleration of a block going down a rough inclined plane. And this is why and how you break up gravity in order to do that. Okay, thank you for being so patient as usual. That's it for today. I'll be around tomorrow if you want to come see me, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you are all great and very patient and we are done. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, they're both smiling, actually. That's nice. Okay, thank you. Bye, Professor. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. You too. Thank Have you. a great day, thank Professor. Thank you. Oh, that was Amy. Thank you very much. You too. Thank you. And thank you, Kevin. Thank you, David. Thank you. Um, uh, Professor, I have, a, I have a question about like um the uh, 